Mark, I'll turn it over to you to do a quick introductions and get things going. Yes, good morning and good afternoon uh, for everyone on the call. Really appreciate you coming out today to our session on Azure API management. Uh, I am Mark Quickle. I'm an Azure specialist with uh, the uh, East EDU group. So I cover K-12 higher ed and academic research. Uh, and um, I'm actually going to turn it over then to Anthony to uh, introduce himself and kind of start us off today. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Mayolo. I am also an Azure specialist here uh, at Microsoft. I do cover the western half of the U.S. Uh, here for uh, for education. And we're going to talk a bit about the importance of APIs and what they do, and really diving more into an API first uh, approach and strategy. So, really, having an API first approach allows institutions to effectively collaborate and connect, and this is to really support the needs and goals of the institution. API first is more than building an API for every product you have. API first is a strategic and tactical method for how you view institution institutional goals, products, uh, and experiences. APIs have become building blocks for modern software for institutions. The growth of APIs reflects a new reality in the fact that technology users demand experiences that span multiple devices with expectations that data and services are instantly available and shareable across platforms. This means that every institution is effectively a software business servicing students and employees. An API first strategy is essential to every institution. Campuses that are adopting an API first strategy are the ones that are gaining ground the quickest in a growing API economy. API first allows you to view your business as a set of API products that work together to provide the features, data and capabilities that your institution supports. Now let's dive into today's discussion and uh, we'll first uh, take a look at some of the challenges EDU customers experience today. Next slide. So some of these challenges, right? Technology and education does come with its challenges. Leading these challenges are expectations that everything should be working and we need it now to quickly just write an application to fix it. These expectations fall to IT and dev teams today and typically are the result of personnel shortages and skilling concerns. Right, IT and dev teams typically wear many hats in EDU. These folks carry the burden of keeping the lights on and interrupting current processes with new technology creates skilling concerns. From learning new technologies to creating time and availability is an ongoing concern and driver on why folks pause adopting API first approaches. The institution has an increased appetite for new applications and features. Institutions need to move at the speed of the student. This creates problems for IT and dev teams to address the needs of the institution. As we know, education customers experience increased standards around governance, security, compliance. This is an ongoing requirement that continues to get more complex each year. Given today's economic climate, education customers experience rising technology costs with limited budget constraints. Remote work is added to the workloads of IT and dev professionals. Remote work, hybrid cloud, and hybrid devices are a challenge to manage. Finally, aging software and hardware systems create a challenge for IT and devs. With these challenges, data and services quickly get disconnected from the administrator, educator, and student experiences. However, these challenges do create an opportunity to explore an API-first approach and quickly connect these experiences. Let's move to the next slide. Yeah, if I may just add a quick quick note too before we do jump on that that first block there that personnel shortages and skilling concerns uh i i've i've been in a couple of sessions even just this morning and yesterday on that very very topic with our edu customers it's a big deal um not only from the perspective of you know hey we're we're expected to do more with less headcount or we can't find the headcount but uh the idea of we need to be able to meet our developers where they are with their current skills and their current abilities and maybe they don't match what our current expectations are and how do we get there so that, that that's a really big deal that we hope our presentation today will to some extent address thank you mark it's a good segue here as far as some of the benefits for an api first strategy right giving your team an api first approach equates to providing positive experiences for the entire institution API first is an approach that allows institutions to do more with less and still meet the institutional goals and objectives. Speed, time, accuracy, 
security, scalability, and reduced costs. These are all benefits surrounding an API first strategy. Examples include dev teams working in parallel, which to build on each other's work and accelerate development. This also helps reduce the cost of application development. Having team members working in parallel reduces costs and, and helps meet the budget needs of the institution. Developers are simply spending less time debugging each other's code. There are also opportunities to leverage low code solutions such as power apps to meet these demands. With teams working in parallel, this quickly increases the speed to get applications to market. Institutions are able to realize value quickly in an API first strategy. This ensures good developer experiences and gives much needed tools to, de to developers. Right, to timely address the needs and goals of the institution and um, keeping developers engaged with the latest technology helps provide a great opportunity in a high demand position. Developers can focus on innovation rather than creating existing or recreating, I should say, existing software. APIs allow them to choose technologies and programming languages that they want to work with. Happy developers equal developer productivity. Lastly, developing an API first strategy helps reduce the risk of failure. A published API is easier to navigate, to identify issues and avoid potential service interruptions. We'll get more into this here in a bit. Simply put, an API first strategy is innovating, it's accelerating, it's transforming, simplistic in nature, and provide for lower operational costs. Now we're going to take a look at some examples around API first strategies found in education. So what does it mean to have an API first strategy in education? Well, centralized managed connectivity to student information systems or other vendor applications with low code and web applications giving positive institutional experiences. This is the data and services uh, provided and uh, are connecting. I'm sorry, this is data and services providing that connected experience uh, to the institution. Monetizing IP and academic medical research. This is important to research teams as they can generate revenue opportunities. Now an API monetiza monetization strategy, it does not come in all size fits all. It should be designed to meet the needs of the API consumer. This could be a free API that facilitates B2B integration like streamlining supply chain. Another example is API consumers pay based on the number of interactions they have with the API. There are several ways to monetize APIs through an API first strategy, and we're happy to discuss these details with you here offline. Uh, forging profitable partnerships with similar schools and alumni institutions. We see this through institutions bridging projects and, and programs to other campuses. And finally, opening new pathways for innovation and growth, whether you're an educator or education partner, uh, creating an API first strategy expands capabilities to reach partners and end users. API first means prioritizing the APIs that support the application and focusing on the value they deliver to the institution. This forward thinking approach allows the application to be adopted by different parts of the institution for multiple users through the API. Now, with that said, let me turn it over here to Mark Quickle to discuss more about the Azure API management. Yeah, thank you for that for that intro, Anthony, and, and the handoff. Appreciate that. Um, just a quick uh, housekeeping. Uh, I do want to keep my eye on the time here. Make sure we save at least a few minutes at the end for questions. Um, so I'll I'll do my best to keep keep uh, my eye on the clock. But Anthony, just hold me accountable to that. If we're getting too close. Um, so. Now we jump a little bit into the technology and how it helps empower some of the things that Anthony was talking about. Obviously, the idea behind API management is not the removal of need for writing well-constructed APIs. So in, in the App Innovation Group, one of the things Anthony and I regularly talk to customers about is what kind of APIs are you writing? How are you writing them? Are they monolithic? Is, do you have a distributed application? Um, all of those types of things come up as part of normal conversations. It's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're talking about here today. However, let's assume that we have APIs available to us and those APIs can live anywhere. They can live in the cloud. They can live in a data center that you have on-prem. They can be a software as a service provided API from a vendor or in a, a competing cloud. Azure API management uh, facilitates the velocity from development to deployment of APIs and along the way it also promotes greater security. And 
what you see here on the slide across the top are sort of the, the key capabilities of the platform. And then underneath that, I've blocked out a few of the areas that I think are, are fundamental things that you should understand uh, as someone who's coming and saying, what can API management do for me? I don't, I'm not going to go through all of them uh, on this first slide because we'll kind of dive into them a little bit as we look at individual capabilities of the platform. But if I can just kind of call out, you know, two areas, you know, the easy API consumption for internal developers along with documentation and mocking. The idea there, right, is the product has uh, a gateway that allows you to decouple clients from the APIs. And that allows your client developers to start writing applications that um, can talk to your backend systems without the implementation of that backend system being developed yet. Uh, it allows us to create mocks and, and to be able to document those mocks. So uh, it doesn't matter if you have a, a, someone in Power Apps uh, trying to uh, consume, you know, potentially, let's say, student or grade data that you may have in your system uh, in their low code application, or if you have uh, another API developer or app developer who may be hosting an, a web application that needs to consume it. Regardless, we provide that mechanism for that to be very, very easy. And as a part of that process too, a, another great example of that would be aggregation of multiple backend services into a single aggregated response. The common thing we have to do as developers, right, would be, you know, again, going back to students and grades, we, we may write a JavaScript application in React, and in, in order to bring a unified view of grade data, we may need to query the, the student data and we may need to query the grade data and, and then aggregate that information together. We may be creating promises in code or whatnot to be able to do that. Well, with API management, we can simplify that ease, especially for, again, for low code developers who may not have necessarily the breadth and depth of skills and knowledge to be able to do that by providing a single unified response that does the aggregation of student and grade data behind the scenes and handles authentication to those and so on and so forth. And that also helps us to avoid a chatty um, IO anti-pattern as well on top of it. And then uh, another thing is our backend services may not necessarily be exposing a client-friendly protocol such as HTTP or WebSockets. And so we, as a client consumer, we don't need to necessarily be concerned with what, what is the backend communication channel for these APIs. We just need to know, hey, we have an API available to us. It follows this format. Maybe we have a standardization of format, authentication, some other things. And so, you know, definitely that that's a big, big part of this as we kind of move forward. You'll hear that theme a little bit more. And then again, the reporting and security, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but um, you know, client authentication being offloaded to the API gateway is a big deal. Uh, it allows us to centralize our authentication and uh, allows us to standardize our authentication and make it easier for our consumers. It does offer IP whitelisting, blacklisting, SSL policy management, other things to help promote a tighter security posture. So um, these uh, blocks that you see represented in the middle are kind of the, the three major uh, areas of API management. Uh, you have consumption on the left, and that consumption is done through our developer portal product. Of course, you can write client applications that would also consume, uh, but we do have a developer portal that, that, that that's done in. And then on the far right, we have publishing. That publishing is the actual creation of the APIs, and that is done within the Azure portal along with all of the metadata and whatnot with a publish. And those are two different audiences. Some of our customers will, will come in and they're looking for the developer portal to kind of be the, the one-stop shop to do everything. But, uh, you know, our product is sort of bifurcated. You're either an administrator and you're a publisher of APIs, and that work, again, is done in the Azure portal, or you're a consumer and then you're using our developer portal. And then in the center, we have this mediator that's kind of the sort of conduit that holds together the, the service. Um, and what it does is accepts calls from clients and, and then it directs it to the appropriate API. But it also has, a, a, again, a rich policy engine that, that verifies API keys, security tokens, certificates, does things like transformation uh, of the, uh, the request and or response. It has built-in caching capabilities, if that's something that you want to take advantage of in logging as well.
So assuming that you have a well-formed API or series of APIs, the first thing you have to do is get the API into the API management system. And uh, there are multiple ways to define an API. Uh, we do allow native uh, importing from an open API specification. So if you're already using some of our newer .NET uh, tooling uh, products, then that will be really easy for you because that open API specification gets generated as a part of your project. Uh, of course, if you're using uh, external products like um, like Swagger Hub to do that work, you can also import that information directly into API management as well, and then, and then uh, go on from there. Uh, and then on the right, you can see you can also create from um, either one of our existing templates that we have or from a blank template. And blank templates are great for when you want to stub out a new uh, API and just kind of uh, give a response back as part of a policy and not necessarily not necessarily have an API already built. But you can see there we have uh, logic apps and we have function apps in there uh, natively. So uh, for those of you that are accelerating already uh, on your API builds through logic apps or functions app, they're very, very easy to, to put in there. So our, our next topic is products and subscriptions. Products are an association of one or more APIs. So whenever you go in and you create a new API into the system, you can associate that with a given product. Uh, or you can later on go into your product management uh, UI screen in the Azure portal and then select APIs that will become part of that product. And once you have your product developed, then you will then uh, allow for subscriptions to that product uh, as an option. And so uh, when users subscribe to a product, they're actually going to get access to the API, or well, to all of the APIs, excuse me, within that product, and they get their own unique subscription key. Now, you can allow users to go into the developer portal and subscribe to a product. And when they do that, they're going to get that key. And that key can be revoked at any time. So if the developers may be uh, abusing or misusing an API, or if they would leave your organization or whatnot, then you can simply go in and revoke their API keys. And now they no longer have access to that product. Uh, additionally, you can also allow for approvals to happen. So when a user goes into, pro into the, the portal and they want to get access to a product, they can request it, in which case uh, you will receive a notification that, um, that there is a, an approval to be had. Once you make that approval, then they will get access to that product. One of the questions that actually does come up uh, about products is, how should how should we productize? And it, it does come back to what Anthony was talking about earlier about monetization. We think about monetization. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you know um, we're we're charging for a product, right? We can think about that more from more generally as productization. And uh, and so um, there are there are different methodologies around how you do your grouping. You may elect to um, do it based on um, an actual product that you have, uh, for example. So if you have a, a portal that you want to provide and you want to provide people access to that portal, you may elect to make that a product. In some cases, we've had customers uh, switch to uh, thinking more departmentally. In other words, I want to have products that are dedicated to HR. And therefore, we're going to create an HR products, and all of the products that are associated with HR would be open to that particular grouping. And that is a fine way to do it as well. We, we, we don't necessarily have any sort of hierarchical way to group products uh, today. Uh, we do allow you to tag products. That's another grouping that we do provide. So you can go in and say, um, I want to create a series of products, and then I want to tag those as HR. And then when they're searching for them, they can find uh, the products that are HR uh, friendly or HR enabled, and they can group on those. But uh, it's not a nested hierarchy. In other words, you, you wouldn't create an HR products and underneath there have sub products associated with HR. So those are just things we try to be thoughtful about whenever you know we're, we're talking to customers about creating products and subscriptions.
So one of the capabilities that API management does afford out of the box is enablement of power platform connectors. Uh, it's a really cool capability. If you do have low code developers, they'll certainly appreciate this. And the idea is that uh, you, can, you can take an API that you may have provided and have a one-click capability that will promote that API as a custom connector to either Power Automate or Power Apps Canvas apps. And um, at that, you know, you can actually do that work manually. Like, like a lot of these things, uh, there's more than one way to, to get it done. The process to do that, though, requires you for every single API that you have to walk through uh, a several page wizard and that several page wizard once completed will create the custom connector. It's not hard, it's just it's just labors in, in nature. And so by doing this, especially if you have a lot of APIs, you can streamline how quickly you can get your APIs from developed to a custom connector to be consumed in Power Platform. Now, in addition to the ease of deployment, there are some other capabilities that you do get inherently on the box. And, and those are the same capabilities that you get that are built into the API management platform. Uh, for example, uh, I've built a number of custom connectors personally, and some of the challenges that I've had as a developer of that is in the Power Apps side, when you log in and you go to the test page and you go to do a test, you may run into situations where that test fails. Why can't it communicate with the backend API? And unfortunately, the Power Apps user interface is not always the most articulate as to why that connector will or will not work. Um, for example, a common thing that we run into is issues with course connect, you know, uh, where you don't have a course policy in place for the uh, API to be able to communicate with whatever backend service it needs to con communicate with. And when you have a course error like that, it doesn't tell you that, it just tells you that it, uh, the data that you got was unexpected. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily overly helpful from that perspective. So you may have people trying to create custom connectors and it's just, it's just taking a little bit more time and effort and energy than you would hope that it would. And so by bringing in uh, API management, you can do all of that testing on the back end uh, and, and you can validate everything that's working fine there before you ever expose it to the front end. So that's one example. The other is this monitoring piece that you see in here and the ability to monitor end to end, especially those aggregated APIs from Power Apps or Power Automate. Now, if you have Power Apps, you can create a Canvas app and that Canvas app can communicate directly with SQL Server. And uh, you would use a SQL Server connector to do that on a premium connector, make that communication to read and write. Our recommendation would typically be create that as an API instead and surface through API management. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is my golden rule that I always say is never put business logic in a, in a uh, Canvas app when it's designed more for front end logic, right? Um, coming just coming from the developer sphere, that makes a ton of sense. So build your, your uh, business logic in your API instead. You can use something like Azure Functions to streamline that communication with SQL Server. So you can still build a connection to SQL Server with essentially no code and surface that information forward uh, to your Power Apps. But now you get much more logging capabilities through API management that will allow you to see what does the latency look like? Uh, did you have an error? Was it transient in nature? Um, and do you have quotas or throttling that you want to set into place for calling the API. And all, all that stuff is toggleable, uh, you know, by the flick of a switch, essentially. So it's very, very easy for you to enable or enable those capabilities uh, and, and impact your, your Power Apps ecosystem uh, pretty easily. So earlier I talked about the development portal. If you remember that was on the consumption side, it is a big part of what the, the product has to offer. Uh, it is Microsoft hosts for you whenever you spin up a new Azure instance, as long as you uh, use the correct SKU, it's not available on consumption SKUs. And um, if you would rather not Microsoft host it and you would like to host it yourself, uh, and or you would like to do a lot of customization to it and 
truly make it fully your own, uh, you can do that because we open source it and we allow you to download it, run your own data center if you like, or on, or on something like Azure App Service. Uh, namely, the product is is essentially a, a content management system, a lightweight content management system. It allows you just like if you were have a SharePoint site or something like that to be able to create new pages and new navigation items. You can drag and drop widgets to the page, such as a content slider, um, so on and so forth. It does support uh, forms based auth as well as Azure AD authentication. And um, and then, of course, it it wouldn't be the APIM developer portal if it didn't also provide all of these rich capabilities to interact with the APIs that you have. And um, so you can do all of your testing right from the portal. You can, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can uh, see your your products there. You can subscribe to products. You can um, uh, you can uh, group, you know, as you're searching for products based on tags and things like that. One of the, the core capabilities of this platform, which, which I personally appreciate, is the ability to auto generate authorization tokens. So you can configure the portal. Uh, if any look in the screenshot there, you can kind of see it on the upper right to, um, you know, get a subscription key uh, or to be able to get an Azure AD pair token, for example. Um, it supports several different uh, authentication mechanisms, but allows you to be able to um, uh, generate those predicated on the user that's logging in. And so like from a developer perspective, how we would do this, right, is we would have an API and that API would have a, a client side application and the client needs to send a bearer token from the client to the, to the server. So we'd create some sort of client harness or client application to do that. And for debugging it locally, we we debug the application, we'd get the client token. And then we, we could bring something like Fiddler up or uh, Postman and from Postman, Right, we could send multiple API requests to test it out um, using that token by putting it into the authorization header of the request. And you can absolutely do that. Obviously, in, in most of these cases, these tokens expire in a very short time period. So you can only do that for a little while until you have to rerun the client application and get another token and go through that process again. And it also means that your testers have to also have access to that client application to be able to test that API or they have to have some manner or method to be able to generate these front end tokens. And so by by using the developer portal and hooking that up, it allows the users to log in. And then once they log in, they can generate their own token and be able to access your API should you allow them to do that. Azure API management does support full versioning and revisioning. Uh, there's already a lot of decisions that you have to make as a developer or development manager on like, how am I gonna version and revision my my API? So we try to at least take take the action of doing it uh, in, in, the, in the portal off your plate, make that a lot easier for you. Um, eventually you're gonna need to make changes to your API uh, over time as, as users are using it. And you may not wanna disrupt callers of that API, and so that's what revisioning allows you to do in the portal. Uh, you do have uh, the ability not only to make these non-breaking changes, but you can also comment uh, uh, in a change log of all the changes that you're making to the API. That's all available uh, in the in the developer portal for the users to see as they're testing. And then you can roll back revisions and changes if you need to. S should uh, should that be uh, a situation where you where you make a new version of a revision, the active version, and you need to go back to the previous version if there would be some sort of problem. And then, of course, we support full versioning as well. Um, I think I got some animations on this particular slide that just uh, didn't didn't load there. Uh, we support full versioning as well. So, you know, if you have a specific versioning scheme, you specify what that scheme is and um, you can either do that as a path, a header or a query string. Um, and then it, it essentially creates a version set that gets adopted uh, that you can use there forward. So gateway policies uh, are kind of a, a bigger topic. It's, it's absolutely one of the core fundamental capabilities of the platform. 
Uh, I think the description you see there on the slide is pretty straightforward. It sets inbound, outbound, and backend controls through configuration. And um, there's a there's a lot of them. Uh, there's a URL at the bottom that you can uh, certainly look up that would give you a lot of examples of the different types of policies that you can do. And so some of them you see there, check header and uh, validate JWT, for example, are, are a great way to help with authentication authorization scenarios. In fact, uh, one of the one of the customers I was working with, they had multiple uh, backend APIs, and what they wanted to do is when a user would hit a single front end API call, which was surfaced through API management, they would get the bearer token and extract the claims out of the token. And as part of those claims, they were including group claims, so they could also see a list of the groups that that user was a member of. And then predicated on whether or not they were in staff and faculty, or if they were just in a student group, they would redirect that back end call to a specific API uh, endpoint. So that's a perfect example of how these policies could work. How would we do something like that without API management? Well, typically we would write some sort of facade API and that facade API would be a single point that a request would be made. And then in code, we would extract out the claims and then we would do some sort of response redirect to the back end call and then surface that information back using some like HTTP client or web client classes in, uh, in, in C sharp, for example. So you can do that. That's absolutely possible. But we were able to do this very, very quickly as a policy. And you know what? If that policy would change at all, we can simply go in, make a, a revision to the uh, to the policy itself, and and now we the back end the back ends could change appropriately, and the front end would be completely oblivious to to that there being any difference. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is IP filtering. There's uh, you can set quotas and throttling in here. There's a JSON to XML and an XML to JSON. Um, so if you want to um, be able to standardize your responses, whether those APIs would be some that you wrote or uh, something a third party vendor, you can easily do that conversion uh, using uh, policy. We do have uh, uh, return response capabilities as well. Uh, which will allow you to just simply return a response. And that's sometimes great. Like, um, you know, as, again, if you're working with your own APIs, you have a lot more control, but sometimes when you're working with third party APIs, they may give you back um, error messages that are a little bit obscure or, or inaccurate, or maybe they're returning back, um, you know, uh, a 401 but you know that the reason it's returning back a 401 is because they don't have specific claims. You can do those checks and return those responses back, you know, um, prior to having to deal with what's coming back from the API. So policies can then be scoped either globally to the product level or the API level, and then they, um, uh, you have some degree of control over the inheritance of the scopes, whether or not they will inherit from the base scope element or not, which kind of go up the chain there a little bit. Um, this is kind of a big deal, uh, in my opinion. If you recall earlier, we were talking a little bit about um, the Power Apps Easy button. Uh, so one of the things a customer that I have uh, was working with ran into was they they came from a background where they had written a bunch of APIs using code. And then he also made an investment in Power Automate. And so we were having a conversation one day about uploading files to SharePoint using the Graph API. And that's absolutely a great way to do it, right? But there, there, was, there was a lot of steps to kind of getting there. We had to create an Azure AD app registration there had to be some sort of certificate in place for authentication um, and then there was a little bit of a learning curve on their part for the graph api which is absolutely understandable uh, if you've never worked with it it's just something you kind of got to get acquainted with and and then they can write the code but you know uh there were some some things there too like uh the 
one group, the security group, was the one who was responsible for setting up the certificates, and the a different group uh, responsible for creating uh, the app registrations in Azure AD was more infrastructure and and uh, and uh, the, the system ops side. So that was a different individual. And so, uh, as we were talking about it, I, you know, we made the comment, "Hey, you have Power Automate." So Power Automate has a connector to, to work with document libraries. So we can expose that uh, an HTTP endpoint on Power Automate as a REST endpoint, and you can send a uh, file as binary to that endpoint and then allow that to be uploaded to SharePoint. And so developing that out took us about 15 minutes to do, wasn't hard at all. And and we were able to um, to, to test it and, and from Postman and upload and everything worked great. So it was it became kind of a pattern as we started talking. Like, well, we have other types of things like this, right? Inter interoperability with SharePoint, um, or and or other services. You know that we think you know the. 800 connectors of Power Automate might be helpful for, right? So, uh, you know, in app innovation, we, we really care about uh, velocity of applications. Of course, security and compliance, all those things are important too. But the ability to allow individuals to, to write, write apps in, in a technology that they're comfortable with and to be able to build them as quickly as possible to meet the demand. So, you know, it was a great conversation because it led into, hey, we have the ability now to write a bunch of these APIs that we might have otherwise written in code before, but we're going to write them now as Power Automate. And we're still going to have other APIs, code-based APIs, especially where there's a lot of complexity. But this gives us something else to play with, a new tool that can do the job. However, there was a concern around how they're going to be grouped and how they're going to be secured because Power Automate uh, doesn't necessarily have the same uh, structure of security that you have when you have control over a web app, a web API or something like that. Um, and so I, on one of the first slides you saw uh, in our session today, I talked about the ability to offload authorization to APIM, and you can absolutely do that here. Uh, and you can set that policy at the product level, and that's the key, because now you can have 50 Power Automate workflows, if you like, and you can offload authorization policy to that product. And now all 50 of those Power Automate workflows will be subject to that same policy. And uh, that means that you don't have to necessarily go into every Power Automate workflow and make changes whenever uh, there should be a change. So I, again, it's just a real world example of something that we ran into that I think is very, very ap applicable at this stage. Just a quick note, we do have something uh, called policy expressions. Those are C-sharp snippets that uh, you can inject into these policies. You can see kind of an example here that allows you to use array types in a context request header. Um, and then there's uh, sort of a uh, when statement that allows you to do conditional logic and so on and so forth. Um, th these can can get a little bit complicated, obviously, so we're not going to get into these in, in too much detail, but do be aware that they are available to you as a way to extend the out of the box capabilities. API management also has the notion of name values. Uh, essentially, it's a key value pair that allows you to uh, store securely. I think the biggest note on here is that you can reference Azure Key Vault uh, secrets at, for, for your name values. So that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. If you already happen to have a bunch of your uh, application configuration secrets in Key Vault, then you know, you don't, there's not a ton you have to do to configure APIM. You simply reference them in, in here. Uh, and then inside of your policies, as you can see there sort of at the bottom, it allows you to uh, to reference that value and that, uh, that key, excuse me, and then it pulls the value and inserts it for you. Uh, 
of quick note here, uh, API management does allow you to uh, configure inside the context of a virtual network. And uh, this would be helpful in, in scenarios, for example, where you would have like an Azure Kubernetes deployment on Azure. You have APIs that live inside of the containers, inside of a VNet, and then you have a load balancer and you want to expose that those APIs to API management. Um, now, it is important to note here that VNet support is only available on the developer tier and the premium tier of the product. So you have to have one of the two to be able to, to use that capability. All right, we're getting through here. We're, we're almost done. Uh, I, I do want to cover yet uh, Azure Application Insights for uh, API management. In my mind, it is a big deal. Um, I'm a big fan of App Insights across the board uh, regardless, but for API management, it certainly makes a ton of sense. Uh, and it's very, very easy for you to configure. So as you can see here, you have uh, incoming request telemetry, as well as backend service dependency telemetry and except, exception telemetry. All three of those are very, very relevant here. Um, and so imagine a situation where you uh, have, as I mentioned earlier, you might have a power automate, or excuse me, a power app, and somebody is saving uh, a record uh, back and, and, and all of a sudden they start getting failures. Well, one of the, one of the challenges is in power apps, uh, depending on the types of failures you get, you may or may not get a ton of information as to why that failed. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of times you'll just see a, sort of a generic error. And so what you can do is you can allow application insights to be able to, to sort of uh, bubble up some of that information for you and give you more information um, about that about that particular error. It also helps in the situations we talked about earlier where you have potentially aggregate of APIs going on and you want to be able to track was there were there issues of latency between the different endpoints or whatnot? Um, you can actually see uh, as uh, as you can see there kind of in the bottom image there. You can have a, uh, a, a an actual API map, uh, an application map that will show all the backend calls that that API is making along the way, and return that result up. And you can see the latency to each of those and you can see failures and then you can deep dive down there. What time did it happen? What browser did it happen? What users did it happen with? One other thing that this is valuable for is, is simply to be able to understand you know, what APIs are being used in the organization and how are they being used? And I think that's really important to understand when you have, you know, uh, constraint on resources. I was doing work with a customer and they had uh, a number of items in the product backlog they were showing me and they said, you know, we had this, we had this product backlog and it's full of all these requests that people are making. And my question to them was, that's great. Well, how are you prioritizing and what does that look like? And the example that I gave is I was I was tasked with writing a an application for a, an, an organization. And one of the features that was very, very commonly being requested uh, was around uh, messaging capabilities. So I wrote the messaging capability that they requested and and went on my merry way and started doing some other things. And the, the team that requested the messaging capability were very, very vocal group and they kept demanding changes on a very, very regular cadence. We want this. No, we want this. And. Um, you know, as we were sitting there and we were prioritizing what features are we going to work on? We got these other things, too, but this team over here saying this is very important. What we could do is using application insights is we could come back to them and say, well, we've actually been tracking your utilization of, of this feature. Here's what you're using and, and capabilities. And you asked for this feature. So we put a feature flag in there. We turned it on. We allowed users to go in. And, he, and guess what? We're not seeing any greater adoption of that feature. And so, you know, that gave our managers the uh, the information that they needed to say, hey, look, we're not going to we're not going to like prioritize the development of the capabilities of this. 
we get you're more vocal about it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more useful in the grand scheme of the things that we want this application to do. One other thing to note about application insights is that uh, if you have a lot of requests to an API, it can potentially, uh, because, because we're logging all this telemetry data, it can create some potential adverse effects. So we do have a, uh, to reduce that, we do have a capability that allows you to sample your requests. Um, obviously you're gonna get less data back, but it does give you a slice then of what your information would look like over time. So there's full control over how much of that, uh, that uh, sampling that you would like to do. And you know, with App Insights, we, we certainly have that as a, a, a first class citizen for all the APIs and API management gives you that single pane of glass, but we have a lot of other capabilities, you know, along the way here too, that you can bring this in. Because you're in App Insights, you can use Stream Analytics to grab that data and pull it out into, uh, into your own database if you want to do your own queries against it, uh, or you can uh, do, use Power BI or other types of solutions. And for our final slide today, I just wanted to quickly talk about operationalizing API management. Um, so uh, a lot of our organizations are going to have multiple environments. In fact, we do uh, generally recommend uh, that customers stand up a development environment using the development SKU. And then in production, you know, you might stand up a standard or a premium SKU. And, and by the way, that's one of the reasons that, that we allow the, the VNet peering in both development and production. Uh, excuse me, premium is the idea is that developers can use developer. Uh, there's no SLA. It's a developer SKU. It's meant, it's meant for production workloads, but, but they might want to test out functionality that would, would be predicated on VNet capability, VNet integration capability. And so we want, we want them to be able to do that in, in dev test scenarios. And then they want to take their APIs that they've uh, in the API configuration and roll those to production. And, and and make that a very very uh, seamless process, right? So, um, so that 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 condition exists, and then what? We, but we want to be able to do that at a very very affordable rate. So that's why we we provide these sort of lower end SKUs that folks can use in development environments. You know, but then questions come up of you know how do we automate the deployment of APIs into API management? How do we migrate configurations from one environment to another? And how do we avoid interference between different development teams who share the same API management instance? And so that's what the uh, the DevOps resource kit that you see there is designed to do. It's available on GitHub, um, and it uh, essentially is there's a, a bunch of programmatization of of the product, and then you can actually deploy it, and it will help handle the the deployment configuration between development and production versions of uh, Azure APIM. And then we do have a full CLI available. Lots of commandlets. You can, of course, create ARM templates that deploy this stuff. You can uh, you use Terraform or um, Bicep or other types of you know uh, infrastructure as code capabilities to do the deployments and the configurations. Uh, and a lot of that's facilitated too through our Azure CLI. So I will uh, stop there, and uh, we have about ten minutes. Uh, certainly open up to questions and and. Uh, See what uh, see what anyone thinks. Hey, thanks, Mark. Um, just so everybody knows, I have given everybody the ability to come off mute. So if you have a question and don't feel like typing it, you can always come off a of mute and uh, ask your question now. Thank you. Or if you're shy, you can type it in chat too. Um, while we're giving that a moment, um, please note that there's a a link there for feedback. So we do appreciate if you would uh, take a few moments to give some feedback on what you liked about the session, how we can improve it, et cetera. Awesome. And while, while folks may be uh, thinking about a question, what have you, Mark, thank you for everything. It was really good information there. Um, I do want to share out a link here in the chat. Uh, so if there's any additional interest or I should say questions around um, Azure DevOps APIM, um, please join us. We do have a, an office hour set up, weekly office hours for app dev DevOps folks here in EDU. 
Uh, this is specific to our EDU customers and it's something that you can count on every single week. So as questions may arise as you, uh, you know, go about your week, you can obviously you know, count on us and, and uh, stop by these office hours to ask questions and, and uh, you know, address certain situations. But I'm going to share that here in the link. And if you'd like, um, you can bookmark the uh, AppDev DevOps office hours and, and uh, come join us. All right, uh, one last call for questions. And if not, we will go ahead and stop the recording. And again, Mark and Anthony, thank you very much for your time. And uh, um, it was great to listen to you guys. Yeah, thank you everyone for your time and your attention. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you everyone.